Hello, I'm B. Riemschneider, Vice President of Content and Events for Advantage Business Marketing's Innovation and Discovery Pillars. I'm here today with Paul Fusson, National Business Development Manager, Life Science for Siemens Smart Infrastructure. We're here at the 18th Annual Lab Design Conference where industry leaders have gathered to learn about the emerging trends in lab design. Today, we're going to talk to Paul about the challenges in lab automation, integrated lab systems, and building management. So with that, um, the first question I have for you is, as new technologies and analytical services are, in, are introduced in the industry almost daily, what are the biggest challenges that labs face when upgrading and enhancing their existing operations? Well, the first challenge turns out to not even be one of technology. The first challenge is getting the organization together, all of the stakeholders, and, and having a clear common vision on what it is they're trying to accomplish, what they're doing today, and what they think they're going to be doing in the future. Uh, sometimes uh, this topic is treated as if it's only the facilities department involved or the IT department. Uh, the safety people are off making their own decision or the scientists are completely separate. No, it ha you have to bring all those folks together because in the end the building is there to support the total mission and it has to be able to do that uh, effectively. Does, does a lab need to meet certain criteria to be a fit for analytical services or for the in larger intelligent lab? Well, obviously, uh, larger, larger facilities are going to get yeah, more, more uh, return on investment. They're going to have more opportunities to implement this. Um, I don't know, buildings maybe with a million dollars worth of uh, uh, utility uh, costs certainly, certainly are, are going to uh, be able to take advantage of this. But even a small laboratory can take advantage of this planning process so that everyone's on the same page. And then you'd be surprised. The existing systems within even these small buildings are, are usually much more intelligent. They have much more information than is currently being utilized. And so by going through this planning process, looking at the existing systems, looking at what they're doing now, looking at what they want to do in the future, they can find ways to improve that and develop a plan that in many cases has a, a relatively small investment and will still be able to give them uh, big paybacks. So you mentioned larger labs, and of course there are labs of every, every type. Uh, do different types of labs have different needs? And, and really, is there some kind of consistent technological factor that crosses over to all the different types of labs? Sure. Well, I guess uh, I, I could say the consistent factor is that uh, labs today uh, all, all need a networked system to be able to bring that information together. But the different types of labs, you're, you're right, they, uh, they have different missions and, and different requirements. Uh, a good example would be a teaching lab versus a research lab at a, at a, uh, a university. Uh, the teaching lab is actually supervised. Uh, the kids don't even get a grade without completing all their work, cleaning up, and essentially taking all the chemical hazards out of the space. Once the chemicals are gone, it's not a lab anymore. You could literally turn everything off. On the other hand, the research lab, you know, it's, uh, it's got lots of chemicals, some of them not well understood, not well known. The hazard level could be relatively high. It's unsupervised work by its nature. Uh, there's nobody in there looking over the shoulder of that researcher. Um, and and it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a more, um, uh, the guy's got a more open schedule. He, he, he could come in any time, day or night. So in that kind of a, a, a situation, the intelligent lab infrastructure is going to be even more important to providing a safe operation and, and the ability to manage costs. Right, right. Well, here at the conference, we're hearing a lot about smart labs and new trends. Um, what exactly is it to get a smart lab into a smart building? That's a big question. Sure. So I, I, we need to think about uh, smart labs as being a subset of, of smart buildings. There's a lot of talk in, in the industry about smart buildings. The, the idea is, again, smart buildings use data differently. They use data, they gather data, and they, they take advantage of it to make the whole building operate more smoothly. Uh, if you are an owner of several buildings, or you've got, and, and some are labs and some aren't labs, or if you've got one big building and some of that space is lab space and some of it is non-lab space, uh, you might want to allocate your, your monies, your investments for a smart infrastructure toward the lab side first. There'll definitely be a bigger uh, return on your investment. And uh, certainly the lessons you learn in that more complicated environment 
will turn into uh, more uh, efficient and cost-effective implementation of the same technologies in the less hazardous areas. So obviously the building maintenance can be monitored and so if you can give some examples of how that works and then what we call lab optimization and sure. how that can work in the larger picture. Sure. So uh, service uh, is going to be provided digitally in, in, this, in this new environment. Uh, you should expect to see fewer trucks out in your parking lot. Uh, we are able to use the data in the system to monitor how things are operating and rather than wait for an alarm or a failure condition, we're able to monitor and look for what we call faults out of normal conditions that are indicators uh, of a coming problem. And then we're able to take action, again, remotely uh, and in many cases, uh, literally 90% of the cases for our digital service center, we're able to fix that problem without having to roll a truck or, or in sometimes without even having to contact the, uh, the building owner. But um, uh, if there is a problem, the other uh, good news is that we're, we're well aware of what the problem is. We've already started the troubleshooting. So the person that arrives, arrives with the right parts, the right tools, the right training, and they're able to go right to the situation and get it fixed faster. So you get faster revolution, uh, resolution of a problem. Uh, you end up with fewer um, unplanned uh, uh, reactive maintenance uh, events. And overall, your building operating costs are going to go down because we're able to look over the shoulder of the system and help with optimization. And, and you asked about optimization. It, it's a pretty highfalutin term, but when you think about it, we know how these buildings are supposed to operate. Some of these systems are supposed to operate. Uh, the, having, having the digital information lets us do that faster and more efficiently. One example is uh, the air handling systems. Uh, part of reducing the uh, energy cost in the building is to use less air when you don't have to. So when you close the sash on a fume hood, you're able to use less air in the, in the fume exhaust system and likewise less conditioned air from the room. Or if you've, de if you've got a system where you're detecting hazardous chemicals and you don't detect anything, you can bring the airflow down. Well, when you bring the airflow down, it turns out that you're able to reduce the energy in the fan in other ways, uh, including uh, uh, changing the pressures up in the ductwork. And this has been a well understood concept for years. Uh, ASHRAE has been driving this as part of the energy code. But with today's systems and the high-speed data communication, we're able to optimize in real time much more efficiently. What's the result? Well, we save energy at the fan, up to 50% of the fan energy, but more importantly, we reduce the, the pressure in the ductwork that is what's generating that sound that you hear from the duct system. So we're gonna make the environment uh, uh, quieter and more conducive to uh, getting the science done. So I think this is an example where uh, uh, digital information being used uh, better today is making for a better environment, uh, a lower cost situation, and a safer environment too. Yeah, and, that, and actually lab managers and uh, facility managers and owners, and of course this researcher who are in the lab, uh, are all about productivity and efficiency, right. but again, you mentioned cost, so cost is another issue that's important. So after you adopt this more holistic uh, digital strategy, what can a company or a lab expect in terms of ROI in terms of a timeline? Sure. So, um, so as I've mentioned, uh, the key to the strategy is getting everybody in the room, getting everybody on the page. And once you, once you get people agreeing on what they want to do, how they want to do it, uh, the, uh, the, it's relatively quick to implement these new solutions. So it could be uh, within three months the group could have its goals set. Within another three months uh, they could start implementing some of the, some of the easier things, the, the low-hanging fruit if you will. Uh, certainly by the end of the first year uh, the uh, building will be seeing significant uh, paybacks. Thank you Paul for all of your Thank insights. You. Thank you. Siemens. Ingenuity for life.